Uh, my name is Dr. Anissa Ramirez, and I'm a professor of engineering here, and uh, I'm a, a scientist. And uh, the reason why I created Science Saturdays is that when I was growing up, I didn't really see too many scientists that seemed to look like me or seemed to have my kind of interests. And so in my time here at Yale, I've stumbled on a few people who are doing such wonderful science, but also have a diversity of backgrounds. And so today we have uh, Dr. Peter Salovey, who will be talking to us a little bit. He'll be talking to us about emotional intelligence. Well, we're in good hands because he's kind of the creator of the concept. And uh, Peter's a little too modest, so I'm going to brag a little bit about him. Um, he's the dean of Yale College, which is one of the highest, position that you, one of the highest positions that you can have at this 300, over 300-year-old 300 institution. That's not bad for a kid from New Jersey. Um, he, came here from, he came here as a junior professor and, and slowly worked his way up to be distinguished. He's now got a chaired position. He was also dean of the graduate school, and now he's dean of the college itself. Now, from that description, or which is actually, he's done quite a bit, which you know, would take up an entire lecture time, um, we can see that Peter has a lot of energy. And, but we'll also see that um, he's got a lot of enthusiasm. And the thing that I admire about him is that he has a way to really convey science in a palatable way. So hopefully we'll get to uh, see some of him, his magic today. So let's uh, warmly, uh, warmly welcome Peter to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all coming on a Saturday morning. And for what it, for some of you is a holiday weekend. And uh, it's really nice that so many people came today. And I want to thank uh, Professor Ramirez for putting this uh, uh, program together. Uh, if you saw the poster, you'll see that there are many Saturday mornings uh, during the spring. Well, there'll be some really interesting uh, people presenting from all kinds of different science and engineering fields. Uh, let me introduce Mark Brackett, who is sitting over here. Uh, drinking his coffee, and he, he's going to share the uh, hour with me uh, and uh, in the following way. I'm going to tell you a little bit about emotional intelligence, and then he's going to do an exercise with you where you can uh, learn to develop your own emotional intelligence through that exercise. Uh, what I'm not going to do, even though there is a whole science here, and we do studies out in the real world, and we do experiments in my lab on human emotions, and how they work and how they affect thinking and how they affect behavior, uh, I'm not going to really walk you through very much of that science. I'm really going to tell you more about what emotional intelligence is and how we measure it and let you try to test yourself a little bit. And then, um, and then as I said, Mark will uh, do a little exercise with you. Um, if, we, uh, if you want to learn more about this, I can tell you at the end about websites and, and uh, other things that we've written that might uh, 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 provide more information and a little bit more of the science behind all of this. So I'm going to ask the question, emotional intelligence, is there anything to it? But you know, th already know the answer I'm going to give, because if the answer was no, I'd be finished with my talk right now. But so uh, we're going to argue that the answer is yes, there is something to it, and it's something that uh, you might want to develop in your own lives. So let me start by asking you to take a look at this uh, photograph. And I show you this photograph not to sort of show off that, hey, look at me, I'm meeting President Clinton, but to uh, contrast the people in this photo with respect to their emotion-related skills. Um, look, notice how the people in this slide look. How does this person look? Reserved, Reserved but what else? What else do you see in her face? Calm, Calm. what else? Content, worried a little bit. She looks a little bit like she's just seen a ghost, actually, to me. But, right? And uh, look at this person here. He's he's working his way. The president is working his way around the room, shaking hands, and uh, she's just shaking hands with him. Oh, I think there we go. She's just shaking hands with him. Now I'm shaking hands with him. Here's my wife. Where, how does she look? You know, over, she looks a little sort of like proud. Oh, look at my husband. He's shaking hands with Bill Clinton. You know? <laughs> right? And now this person here on the right, uh, this person here on the right in the, in the striped sweater, uh, what does she look like? Yeah, it's a fake smile. It is a fake smile. You can tell that because it, she's got a little bit of the mouth going but not the eyes. And the reason why it's a fake smile is why? 
Yeah, <laughs> she's a Republican. Yeah, I think she's just nervous. You know, she's getting ready. You know, you get two sentences to say to the president. And she's thinking up her two sentences right now, and she is trying to get ready to see him. Now look at me and, and uh, President Clinton. Notice the difference in our faces. Yes, he has more gray hair than me, and he's taller. That goes without saying. But notice the difference. I'm looking happy but, but anxious. I'm worried that I'm going to make a bad impression on him. We, we had actually met out in front of the building about 10 minutes earlier. So what he's saying to me right now is, didn't I just meet you out in front of the building? Aren't you the dean? And I'm sitting there thinking, don't say anything stupid. Don't say anything stupid. <laughs> so I look very anxious, happy but anxious. And you can see it because I'm all kind of, I'm sort of hunched up. And you can see a little bit of anxiety. It's not obvious. Uh, you know, I'm good. I can cover up the anxiety a bit. But he, the most comfortable person in this room, is clearly Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton was famous for being uh, a very uh, emotionally engaging person. He was the person who would say, I feel your pain. Right? He understands your emotions. Uh, people who meet him always would talk about um, <coughs> how Bill Clinton made you feel comfortable. He made you feel like you were the only person in the room, that he was talking only to you. And that's certainly what he's uh, doing here. He's making me feel very important. Like, like he's happy to meet me as opposed to I'm happy to meet him. And, uh, and he's trying to put me at my ease. These are very good skills to have. He's looking to make me feel comfortable. You'll also notice he's trying to make sure my wife doesn't feel left out. And so look where his left hand is. It's around her shoulders. He's bringing her into the conversation. And for the parents in the room, you may think that that uh, also talks about, that also reminds us of some of the problems that Bill Clinton actually had uh, <laughs> regulating his uh, emotions. Problems we don't need to go into this morning. Now, I put this slide up to sort of remind us that uh, people differ. People differ in the skills with which they uh, deal with their emotions, the emotions of other people, their ability to manage emotions. If I were better at managing my own emotions, I would look nothing but overjoyed as opposed to happy but nervous. And, uh, 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 and uh, also their ability to regulate the emotions of other people. Bill Clinton is making me feel, trying to make me feel more comfortable. Now, why do we think it's important to look at emotions in this way, to look at these individual differences in the way in which people deal with their emotions and the emotions of other people? Well, the reason we think it's important to look at these things is because we believe that our emotions are smart, that we have evolved an emotional system because it helps us survive in the world. Now, Darwin never used the word emotional intelligence, but we think if Darwin were alive today, he might. Darwin might say our, our emotions are an intelligent system, and they're an intelligent system for two primary reasons. First, our, it's our emotions that help us survive in the world by energizing behavior that we need to do uh, uh, in the immediate situation to help us survive or help our species survive. So for example, if I'm being chased by a predator that wants to eat me and I'm feeling afraid, that fear makes me run faster and I escape the predator. If an enemy uh, or, or another member of my species is blocking a goal. My goal is to eat that food over there, and another, uh, uh, I'm a dog, and another dog is trying to eat that food or block me from eating that food. What do I do? Well, I look angry, and I snarl, and uh, if I get angry enough, and I have to, it, it helps me chase away the other dog or fight the other dog. Um, so what our, what our emotions do, in part, is energize our behavior so that we get up and do what we need to do. Okay? You all probably know if you play sports, a certain amount of emotion helps you uh, play better sports. Too much, maybe, and, and, and you get worse. Right? But, but you can run faster if you're feeling something than if you're feeling nothing. The other reason why Darwin might have said our emotions are smart is because our emotions are accompanied by something on our face that communicates something to our species mates, or maybe even to another species. It communicates that there is something going on in this environment that needs to change. 
What could that be? Well, uh, Darwin laid out a few of these in his book called The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. He said, what do, what do most animals do when they're angry? They bare their teeth and growl. And what is that communicating? That's communicating, you're annoying me. You're blocking my goal. You're getting in my way. And you see these teeth? I got teeth, right? You see them? They're going to end up sunk into your flesh if you don't knock it off. Okay? Okay? And then the other animal backs away, typically, and everybody lives, survives to see another day, which that's, that's Darwin's bottom line, right? When I smile, when an animal smiles, or does something that looks like we say looks like smiling, the animal is communicating, I have teeth, but I'm not going to use them today on you, right? It's safe to approach me. Maybe the easiest one to see is fear. Let's imagine a bunch of sheep. You don't see sheep in New Haven very often, but try to imagine a bunch of sheep. And they're, they're grazing in a flock. And an enemy of sheep arrives on the horizon. Sitting on a, a bluff, on a, on a hill, looking down at the sheep is a coyote. And the coyote is looking at the sheep, licking his chops, getting ready to, thinking about which of these sheep is going to become its lunch. Right? Which sheep is he going to turn into a lamb chop? Well, imagine how, imagine if every sheep in the flock had to look up, see that coyote, recognize it as a predator, and make a plan, and then act on that plan and run away. Well, some of those sheep who look, the ones who look up last, they're going to, uh, they're going to be behind the flock. They're going to be the last sheep out of the, out of the meadow, and they're probably going to turn into the lunch of that coyote. In fact, that's not what happens. What happens is the sheep are looking around like sheep, kind of randomly, right? So sheep are just, they just sort of look around. One of them happens to see the coyote. The coyote triggers a, what we would say is a fear response in that sheep, and the sheep gets a look on its face, okay? I, I grew up in cities, and so I've never really seen this look in a sheep. Maybe someone here has. But I imagine what that sheep does is something like this. <laughs> right? That's the sheep in the headlights look. That's the <laughs> and that signals that that sheep, uh, that signals to all the other sheep that there's something wrong. In fact, the sheep who has that look, he might make some noise, bleat or something, to call attention to that face. All the other sheep look at that face, see that face, and say, I don't know why he looks that way, but I'm getting out of here. And they do. They start to run. It triggers a kind of response where they, they run away. Well, it's not just sheep who do this. It's humans who do this. So if you go to a preschool and look at little kids, say three-year-olds, two-year-olds, uh, uh, playing, and imagine you give the two- or three-year-old a new toy to play with, a toy that's a little scary for a two or three year old. Okay? Maybe it's a big uh, puppet or, a, or a, uh, something like the Energizer Bunny that's making a lot of noise. And what happens? Well, the two or three year old typically will look at the toy and then look around for an adult that it knows. Often it's mom, but it doesn't have to be. It could be dad, it could be, but usually some adult that it knows who has played a caretaking role in that baby's life, in that, in, in that uh, toddler's life looks around and looks right at his or her face. And what that two or three year old is looking for is something reassuring in the face. So if mom or dad smiles, you know, makes a big smile, uh, the two or three year old will then move toward the toy. But if mom looks really worried, if mom looks like the sheep who sees the coyote, what will the, what will the two or three year old do? Typically back away from the toy, won't play with that toy. You could see this in infant. You could see this in, in, a, in a baby less than a year old. Okay? And what they're doing is exactly what the sheep are doing. They're using the emotional expressions of someone else to try to decide if the situation is safe or not. We call this social referencing. And it's the kind of thing that Darwin described. It's the kind of thing that helps uh, uh, a species or an individual uh, survive. Now, there are other reasons why we know that emotions are smart. Uh, this is a really unfortunate person in this slide. 
if this happens to you, there, there's a, I, I, I was going to introduce this slide and say, there are a couple of professors at Yale, but I realize that you might believe me. Let me tell you what, what happened to this guy. This is a guy named Phineas Gage. Okay? And Phineas Gage lived in Vermont, where he was a railroad worker in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century. And Phineas Gage had a really interesting job. His job was to look at where the railroad track needed to be built and uh, drill a hole if there was rocks in the way, you know, boulders or, or cliffs or mountains in the way, to drill a hole in the rock, fill the hole with gunpowder, tamp it down with an iron rod, and then put a fuse in it, move far away, light the fuse, blow up the rock. Okay, that's how they put railroads through. Well, one day Phineas Gage had a horrible thing happen to him. In fact, the day was September 13th, 1848. It was at 4.30 in the afternoon. He was sort of at the end of his work day. And what happened to Phineas Gage? Well, he found there was a huge boulder in the way of the railroad track. Uh, and so he drilled a hole in it. And he filled the hole with gunpowder. And he took out his tamping iron, the big rod that he used to smash down the uh, gunpowder. And he started to tamp it down. And the iron rod rubbed against the rock, side of the rock in the hole, and created a spark. And the spark lit the gunpowder so that the rod, and it blew up. I mean, and it blew up in a big way, because there was a lot of gunpowder in that hole. And the rod shot out of the hole in the rock. And he was, of course, at the time looking in the hole, right? Because he's tamping this down. It shoots out, and it, 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 it fires itself right through his skull. I know this is sort of disgusting for Saturday morning, but it shoots itself right through his skull from the bottom, basically below his cheek, right? And comes out the top. So that when the doctors find him, as I know it's disgusting, when the doctors find him, he's laying on the ground with a rod coming up through his skull and out the top of his head. And what you see is it, it has destroyed a piece of his brain. Okay? Now the doctors, the amazing thing about this story, especially when you think of it, think it's, it's 1848. The amazing thing about this story is that the doctors pull the rod out I think with no anesthesia, but that's not so bad. The brain doesn't have much in the way of pain receptors, so it doesn't really hurt them that much when they pull the rod out. When the rod went in, that hurt. <laughs> but taking it out, that was nothing. Anyway, so they pull the rod out. He recovers, and I could show you slides of, of a, a clay model of his head. And you can see, he recovers. He's got an intact head, and the, some scar tissue has grown over the hole in the top. And he recovers. And he's walking and talking. He lives another 25 years, Phineas Gage does. He doesn't do too much more railroad work. <laughs> In fact, he takes early retirement. But you know, the two amazing things are, A, that he's alive, and B, that he isn't walking around the rest of his life with a big rod coming out of his head. So, but he's not the same person. He's not the same person. The rod has destroyed a lot of the parts of the brain having to do with his emotions and his ability to control his emotions. And so most of the time, he's pretty flat, doesn't really have many emotions at all. And some of the time, he gets riled up for no reason. But he's got, his emotional system is kind of haywire. Now, what's interesting is he also can't make decisions. He has no preferences anymore. He doesn't know what he likes and what he doesn't like. If you would say to Phineas Gage, would you like chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? I don't care. Right? If there was television at the time, which of course there wasn't, if you said to him, what would you like to watch on TV? He wouldn't know what he wanted to watch. He could answer the question, I don't care whatever you want. I don't know, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, doesn't matter to me. And the reason why is his, the part of his brain that was still intact, that was not damaged, were the parts that have to do with decision making and problem solving. But they didn't have access. They didn't have connections anymore to the part that had to do with emotions. And because he didn't have the parts that had to do with emotion anymore, the part that had to do with decision making couldn't draw on his emotions to help him make decisions.
We need our emotions in order to think, to problem solve, to make decisions, to decide what we like and don't like. Okay? So our emotions are smart not just because they help us survive in the way that Charles Darwin would have said, but they're also smart in the sense that they inform our decision making. They help us make decisions. Okay? They help us solve problems. Okay. So with these ideas in mind, a few years ago, we proposed maybe there's an intelligence of emotions. Maybe there's a way in which some people are particularly good at monitoring their own and other feel people's feelings, that is, observing them, discriminating among them, that is, telling them apart, and using this information to guide their thinking and their behavior. And we argue that this is an emo like an emotional intelligence. And uh, we can uh, break that down if you want. We could say an emotional intelligence has four basic kinds of skills. That is, identifying or perceiving your emotions and other people's emotions, right? Using those emotions to help you think. Understanding emotions, that is, particularly being able to talk about them, use language to describe them. And managing your emotions, calming yourself down when you're upset. Psyching yourself up when you need to be psyched up. Calming somebody else down when they're upset. That would be managing emotions. And, that, and so we tried to develop a test to see if we could I identify people who were particularly good at these sorts of things or people who weren't so good and could learn to be better. And so we developed a test called the Mesquite, which stands for Mayer Salovey Caruso Emotional Intelligence Test. Those are the other two guys uh, who uh, helped with this. Jack Mayer is a professor at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, David Caruso is a psychologist uh, who works with people uh, in business uh, in uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut. And uh, we, we developed little tasks that we used that we hoped would help us figure out who was good at these skills and who could learn to be better at these skills. And so we had tasks like the following. I'm going to ask you to see if you can guess the answers here. This one's kind of easy. We would ask things like, what emotions do you see in this person's face? What emotions do you see in this person's face? That he's happy. happy. That's good. Do you see fear? Do some people see fear? Very good. He says he sees just a little fear there. Maybe she's worried about getting her picture taken and is kind of uncomfortably smiling for the camera, doesn't want an embarrassing picture. And you're right. There's actually, this is actually a kind of classic fake smile. The mouth is smiling, but the eyes aren't smiling very much at all. The eyes are kind of sad. In a real smile, your mouth is curled up, but your eyes crinkle in the corners too. And her eyes aren't crinkling very much because she's a little afraid. So you might say this is a three or four on happiness and maybe a two on fear, something like that. Okay. Of course, we ask many more questions with many more faces. We might show you something that an artist creates and we would say, how much is each of the following feelings expressed by the artist in this picture. So the artist has painted this picture. Yep, come back. The artist has painted this picture, and we would ask, how much happiness is the artist trying to convey? How much sadness, fear, anger? Anybody have any ideas about this one? Yes. Looks more sadness than happiness. Why is that for you? Looks dark. It's a sunset, the day is fading away, the day is turning into night. Yeah. Great, that's good. That's good. So that to him that, that conveys a bit of sadness that it's the end of the day, not the beginning of the day. It's interesting. About half the people I show this picture to say, it's the dawn of a new day, and about half the people say the sun is setting. And and I think it depends on whether you live on the east coast or the west coast. <laughs> we can also ask you questions. Uh, that try to get you to use the language of your other senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, to describe emotions. I find these very hard, but here's a, here's a question. Imagine feeling totally surprised because you got a birthday present that was unexpected. How much 
is the feeling of surprise like, whoop, come back, like cold or warm, like blueness, the color, like sweet, like sour, like salty. You get, get the idea. I find these very difficult to do. A lot of people find them difficult to do. It's kind of a weird question. Okay? We might ask some questions about how your emotions connect to your thinking. So imagine you're Sherlock Holmes, and you're, trying, you're a detective, and you're trying to solve a crime. What emotion might help you solve the crime? Well, it turns out, we've done studies in my lab, where we put people into different emotions, and we look at in which emotional states are they better at solving these would be like a deductive reasoning problem, solving certain kinds of reasoning problems, like a detective solving a crime. Turns out a little bit of negative emotion helps you. It focuses you. It makes you very attentive to detail, concerned about missing out, missing something. Okay? Darwin might have argued that this makes sense. How do I, do people, have, do people know this? Do people know this at all? Other questions? This one might be a little hard for Younger people here, but uh, uh, I'm sure some of you know the word contempt, right? Like being in contempt of court, you know, in a courtroom. Uh, what is contempt? We'll just ask you a vocabulary question. What is contempt? Well, it might be a mixture of what? How many people think it's surprise and anger? Okay. Anger and fear. Maybe. Anger, anxiety, and fear. More. Disgust and anger. A lot of people think disgust and anger. Hatred and guilt. Okay. Turns out that uh, uh, you get points on these tests for the best answer. You get most points, but you also get points for answers that people, general people or experts, depending on how we score it, think are plausible answers to. Probably the best answer is B, disgust and anger. Uh, we can all, let me give you uh, uh, a couple of different ones. We can also ask questions about managing your emotions. So this is a little hard to see, but we ask you uh, uh, questions about the effectiveness, how useful different ways of managing your feelings might be. So this is about a person named Debbie. She's just come back from vacation. She's feeling peaceful and content, ha basically happy. How well would each of the following actions Keep her feeling happy and content, right? The idea is we, she wants to stay happy. What does she do now? Well, she starts to make a list of things at home that she needs to do. How, how many people think that would be a good strategy? Not a very good strategy. She began thinking about where and when to go on her next vacation. That's a pretty good strategy. You've been on a great vacation. You start thinking about the next one. She decided it was best to ignore the feeling. Would that maintain it? Probably not. She called a friend to tell her about the vacation. That's a good answer, too. So we all agree that number two and number four are probably better answers than number one or number three for staying happy. I'll give you one more of these, and then we'll move on. So Ken and Andy are very good friends. Ten years. Recently, let's say uh, Andy was put in charge of a project, but Ken was appointed to be the helper on the project. So he feels this, and he begins to dislike Andy. But he feels bad about not liking Andy's his old friend. Andy's been put in charge of him. He doesn't like it. He starts to hate Andy, but he feels bad about hating Andy. So what might he do? Well, he might, whoop, come back, come back. He might try to understand Andy's new role and try to adjust. Anybody think that's a good, good idea? Not a bad idea. He's more likely to do that one than the other one. That's right. Ken, another possibility is he would approach Andy, confront him, that is, get angry at him, and tell him, you know, you're not going to boss me around anymore. How many people think that would be a good idea? Yeah, I thought you might think that would be a good idea. <laughs> anyway, some of these are better than others, and I'll let you try to figure out which ones those might be. Well, it's interesting. When we look at people, we've now given this test. We gave it to 5,000 people. Mark, how many people now would you say have taken that test? 10,000? Good 10,000 people have taken this test. And we, all, we also have a version for 
kids of different ages. This one's uh, for kids who are a little older than some of you and for adults. But we also have one for middle school students, too. And we find that, that people who score better on these kinds of questions are people who remember their, their childhood, their early childhood, and say, I had a good relationship with my parents, are people who are more likely to put photographs in their room of their family members, right? are people who uh, like to work with children, are people who are not likely, less likely to use drugs, and are people who are less likely to get into fights. And when, they, when we talk to their teachers, their teachers tell us uh, they don't know how the kids in the class have scored, but they'll say, see this kid right here? He never, never gets in a fight with another kid. And then we'll look up the score and we'll see, ah, he did well on the test. Right? What else do they do? Well, these are adults working at a company in Connecticut, an insurance company in Connecticut. And we measure their emotional intelligence using our test. And then we watch them for a while. And we ask the other people in their workplace and their bosses to describe these people. And the ones who scored high on our test were described by their boss and, their other, and the other workers as more sensitive, as more sociable, that is more friendly, as someone you like better, as someone who makes it fun to work at this company, as someone who deals with stress well, someone who's generally in a good mood, and someone who they think would be a good leader. Okay. Now, what would you say, if we really wanted to know whether our test predicts something important at work, something that, that would reflect that you're a really good worker and you've done a good job in this company, what, what, do you, what kind of data should we collect? What, what would we really want to know? Salary, right? We'd really want to know who gets a big raise at the end of the year and who doesn't. And so we, in fact, did that. And we found that we could predict, based on the test, which people got big raises at the end of the year and which people got small raises at the end of the year. Right? It wasn't perfect. And there were other factors that went into whether someone got a big or small raise. But we could, uh, about 25%, of the variability in raises, we could account for with their emotional intelligence. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. I could have we I could have uh, 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 taken bets with people about who's going to get the biggest raise at the end of the year and won some of those bets. Okay? I actually think that's a little scary. Maybe you do too. Anyway, they got bigger raises, higher salaries, and they were promoted faster in this company. Okay. One last set of examples, and then I'm going to turn things over to Mark, and he's going to talk to you about how you can work on your own emotional intelligence. We did a study where we went into a school. Uh, basically, these were, I think, eighth and ninth graders, if I remember. And we measured emotional intelligence in the school. That's what EIQ is. That's their, uh, their score. And we simply asked these uh, uh, students to write a story about a time when somebody was pressuring them to do something they didn't want to do. And to talk about all the emotions they were feeling in that situation and all the ways in which that situation was difficult for them and what did they do. Okay? And what I want you to notice is the way the emotions and the maturity with which these students talked about the situation and note their EI, their emotional intelligence score, at the same time. So here's somebody who gets 100, and 100 is average. Okay, 100 is average. And he says, they wanted me to beat the hell out of someone. Violence makes me uncomfortable, but they won. I fought. But he says, I try not to hurt him. I try not to harm him. Now, what's interesting about this guy, he's average, and he says, you know, they tried to make me do something I didn't want to do, and I did it anyway. And he also doesn't talk too much about emotion and his feelings and the pressure he was under. But he does say one nice thing, which is that he actually didn't try to hurt the person. Okay? 
Let's look at another person. Notice this person has an even higher score. Some of my friends started mooning cars. We all, we all know what this is, right? I don't have to explain it. Please don't make me explain this. No, 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 don't make me explain it. I would, right, my, my, Dr. Brackett says, you can explain it, just don't demonstrate it. <laughs> I was in Japan last week talking about emotional intelligence, and I used this example in Japan, and I looked at the audience, most of whom did not speak English. They were translating, and I could see this word mooning didn't mean the same thing in, Jap in Japanese. And I could see the look on people's faces, right, because I'm trying to learn how to read people's faces better, and they look confused. And I was thinking to myself, how do you explain what mooning is in, ja in Japan? Right, this isn't the kind of thing that Japanese school children do on their school bus, let me tell you. And I realized that there was a long way to explain what mooning is, and there was a quick, short way to explain what mooning is. And I was torn trying to figure out which way to explain it. Decided to just skip it all together, actually. Some of my friends started mooning cars. I guess if it weren't for the values instilled on me when I was little, I probably would have joined them, but I didn't do it. This guy has more emotional intelligence, but he still doesn't talk about emotions that much. But at least he talks about values. At least he talks about resisting the pressure. Yeah? Well, that's part, that's, you're, you're actually right. He says, maybe the reason they're not talking about their feelings is because they're kids, and kids don't talk about their feelings. And, and he's right. When we look at how people do on our tests, as they get older and older, they do better and better. And uh, it's one of the, uh, I'm, I'm uh, 47 years old, and it's one of the great gr things that makes me happy in my life is that between age 45 and 50, that's where you get the best scores on this test. And so I'm, I'm <laughs> right? You've got a ways to go yet. You've got another, whatever, 30 years or so. But I'm, I'm hitting my peak here. Here's, here's the kid who scored the highest in our, in our group. Okay? I don't want to make this a competition. It's not a competition. It's not good or bad to score high, but people differ. And everybody can learn to be better at this thing. It's like learning how to be a, a, a hit a baseball better or, or, or a spell better or what have you. It's a skill. So this person has a very high score. And uh, whoop, come back, come back. And... Uh, uh, I think this is a boy. He says, once my friends wanted to sneak into someone's room and paint him while he slept, please don't try this. It's a very bad idea. It began as joking around. Wouldn't it be funny? Could you believe it if you did this? Then it slowly evolved into dares. I bet you wouldn't do it. I dare you to do it. Whoop, come back. I felt like it was betraying the trust I had with this person. I didn't feel right sneaking up on a sleeping person with no way to defend himself. And I thought doing this would make the person have his feelings hurt, right? He's worrying about the feelings of the other guy. I know how little pranks like, like this could really hurt somebody's feelings, right? This guy is worrying about the feelings of the other person. So what happened? I told them straight out that it was a degrading thing to do, that it's a, it, it was a bad thing to do, and they shouldn't be so cruel. What would my parents have said? My parents would have said, they were proud of me, but maybe I also ruined a perfectly harmless joke. <laughs> Who do you think has higher emotional intelligence, the parents? Or the, I won't make you, I won't make you uh, vote. But what you see here is the kid is talking about feelings, talking about the feelings of the other person, actually showing what some of what we would call emotional intelligence. Uh, there was a, we actually had a, uh, it's verbal intelligence. It's a, it's a vocabulary test, basically. It gives us a little sense of, we, we just want to show that all of these kids are more or less the same in terms of their general vocabulary, their general verbal intelligence. Okay? So what has happened in the last... 10 years or so, is the idea of emotional intelligence has become very popular. So this was a best-selling book that was written about 10 years ago, and it made people all over the world know about emotional intelligence, which both made us proud, but also nervous. Because at the time that this became so popular, there wasn't much science. We had written a couple of articles with no experiments in them, no studies in them, and yet everybody was paying attention. 
And this is one of the problems in doing science. Sometimes the general public starts to get a sense that the science is way ahead of where it really is, and that puts pressure on the scientists to try to come through and, 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 and fill out the story, and that's a difficult situation. So it got covered all over the world. This is a magazine in Germany. You see at the very top, what's your EQ? Uh, this is a magazine in Spain. This is a magazine in Japan, like Superman. And all over the world, people have started using emotional intelligence in interesting ways, using it to help put people in the right kind of jobs, right? So let's say you're running a trucking company, and you have to pick the people who are going to drive the long distances by themselves alone versus the people who drive the short distances and make deliveries and interact with lots of people. Who do you want your most emotionally intelligent truck driver to be, the guy who drives alone for hours across the United States, or the guy who has to work with people? Probably the second one. Understanding politics. There's been interesting looks at the most recent elections trying to figure out why uh, certain candidates win and certain candidates lose by looking at the way they connect emotionally with other people. Uh, marketing, like a television commercial, how does emotion play a role in getting people to buy things, even things they don't need? And my favorite is in schools, we're starting to see, maybe in some of your schools, we're starting to see people being taught about their emotions, learning how to talk about them, learning how to share their feelings, learning how to become aware of the feelings of others. My favorite one is in Australia, the way in which gym is now being taught through a new curriculum, a new PE physical education curriculum, is that gym is actually not about learning to be a better baseball player or learning to be a better football player. It's really about learning how to be a graceful winner, learning how not to be a sore loser, learning how to work in a team, right? It's about gym is an emotions class, right? How many of you think your gym class is an emotions class? Not too many. Mine wasn't, that's for sure. And so it's a new approach to gym, and there's a uh, the guy who's head of all gym teachers in Australia is a guy named Graham Dodd. He's known to his friends as Dotty. And what Dotty is trying to do is teach gym teachers how to teach about emotions in gym classes. All right, let me stop there and bring on Dr. Brackett, who will do uh, 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 a little bit on how you can learn to have uh, more emotional intelligence. on the back that changes the slide, not the front. Great. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Great. Yeah, all right. Thing on the back. So what we're going to start off with now is um, what Peter and I and some other people uh, have worked on is what we call a blueprint for emotional intelligence. This is for parents, for students, for teachers, and for everyone to use. Um, you saw that the first area of emotional intelligence was this idea of perceiving emotions and faces, right? So can you detect, for example, how someone is feeling? Or are you, even, are you even aware of how you're feeling yourself, right? And the way we like to use this in our daily lives is, um, let's say you're having an altercation, right? You're having a fight with someone or someone is about to argue with you, right? Take a moment and just think for one second, right? How am I feeling? Oh. How is this other person feeling? And why is this important? Well, emotions contain data right, about people. We learn, right, if I can see that that person coming after me is quite angry, I, I know to get the heck out of there, right? Or I know maybe I better think about a strategy, right, to start using to help me handle the situation, right? I also teach martial arts, and this is one of the key things that I can use, right? If I have an enemy coming towards me, and I can see in his face or her face is anger, right, which I know is an irrational emotion, right? When someone's really angry, they're not thinking, well, let me not hurt this person. They're just thinking of a way to get at you, right? I can say, well, do I have the skills to handle this person? Well, if they're that big, maybe. <laughs> but if they're 300 pounds and, and this big, it's telling me, get out of there fast. 
The other thing, the, other, the second area of emotional intelligence is this idea of using emotions, right? So what we can also do, let's say you're, uh, let's talk to the parents now for a moment. So you've noticed that your child is angry or upset, right? The second thing you can ask yourself is, how do I want myself to feel and how do I want them to feel, right? What kind of mood do I want to induce in that child or even in myself to in order to handle the situation better? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Good point. There you go. So how do I want to feel? How do I want you to feel? Uh, this is the second area of emotional intelligence, right? You can use this, for example, as uh, Dr. Salovey talked about a, oops, a little while ago. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. I'll skip that part. In, um, right, if, you're feeling in a very, if you're feeling negative, right, really, really down, right, that might not be the best time to ask your parent for your allowance, right? <laughs> right? You know the best time to ask them for your allowance is when they're feeling very positive and up. Right? The same thing goes in school, right? As a professor myself, you know, if I'm in a negative mood, right, it's probably not a good time to come to my office and ask me, you know, to change your grade. Right? But if you come in and say, well, you know, that class was really great today. I loved your lecture. By the way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just curious, you know, is there any way you can, you know, give me a better grade? You know, I may not do it, but I'm certainly going to be more likely to. The third uh, area of emotional intelligence that we try to have you think about is this idea of understanding emotions, right? Do you have the vocabulary, for example, to express yourself clearly, right? What we know, for example, is that young children, uh, kids in fourth, fifth, sixth grades who don't have the vocabulary to express themselves, what are they likely to do, right? If you can't tell someone how you're feeling, how does that make you feel? Someone just volunteer. Frustrated, right? And what, it, there's a, what does frustration lead you to do? Get angry, right? And then you get angry, and what do you do? Right? I'm sorry? You can act out. Exactly, right? If you can't tell someone, listen, I'm really feeling upset about what, the way you treated me the other day, right? You get this emotion inside that it just stirs up, right? You don't know how to express it, and you go back to primitive, that earlier brain, part of your brain that's survival, and you just go in there and beat the heck out of them, okay? And what we find is that young kids and children who have a good vocabulary to describe their feelings actually are perceived, as Dr. Salovey, by their teachers, as Dr. Salovey said, by their teachers to be more pro-social, to get along better with children, even by their peers in class, right? So we've done research, for example, where we have a whole class fill out a survey about who's more popular, who gets along well with others, and what we find is that children who have better emotions vocabularies uh, are better, are, are perceived to be uh, liked more, and by their peers and their teachers. Now this fourth area of emotional intelligence, as we talked about, is the idea of managing emotions, right? So let's take this, let's go through the whole um, procedure now. Let's say you're gonna really use this blueprint for your everyday life, right? So the first thing that happens is you say to yourself, all right, how am I feeling, right? How is the other person feeling? Do I know what's going on inside me? Do I know what's going inside the other person, right? We're not always good at this, so what's a good thing to do? Ask, right? Don't just assume, right? I've had this happen as a as a teacher. I had one student who used to watch. She used to cause she's a graduate student come into my into the lab, and I'd be grading her papers, or not grading, but just reading over her work. And she said, "I have to leave the room," right? Which was kind of weird to me. And I was like, "Well, why do you have to leave the room?" She's like, "Because you look disgusted when you're reading my paper." <laughs> I said, "Well, I'm not disgusted. I'm actually really interested in it." She's like, no, you're dis I, I just cannot be in the room with you when you're reading my paper, right? Now, what happened is that we actually have a great relationship now. Why? Because she told me that, right? I really wasn't feeling disgusted by her work, but I would guess I was so intense by reading it and like using a red pen or something that it made her very nervous. So she just said to me, well, you know, it looks like you're really disgusted. And I said, well, I'm glad you told me that because the truth is I think your work is amazing and I'm just interested in it and I'm just really intense. But if she had never asked me, what, would have ha what could have happened? She would leave there feeling nervous and sad, right? Because she's thinking that I don't like her work, when actually I really do. So this is the idea of using these skills in your everyday life, right? If you're not sure, just ask somebody. Using emotions, right? How do I want to feel? How do you want to feel, right? If I want you to feel good, maybe I'll give you a compliment. Or maybe um, exactly just like that. Do I have the vocabulary to express myself again? Can I, do I have the language to actually articulate clearly how I'm feeling? And finally, what am I willing to do and what am I able to do, right? Do I know the strategies? A lot of us just don't know it, right? We weren't taught, right? We weren't taught that maybe uh, if I got a, let's say I my cell phone ring right now and something really bad happened, 
like a family member got very sick, right? It might be the best thing for me just for a few minutes to distract myself, right? Let, let's just, okay, I'm going to deal with that, but let me just get through this next 10 minutes, right? If I started hysterical crying and, and really getting upset, maybe uh, it wouldn't be the best thing to do. I could handle it for a few seconds and then, uh, and then deal with my emotions later on appropriately. Now, what I want to do is show you a program that I've worked on for the last few years, and it's in many middle, middle schools right now, and we're testing it, um, is just think about this for a moment. Have you recently felt isolated or as if you didn't belong somewhere? How many people have felt that way? Raise your hand. Really high. Really, really high. How many of you have felt that way in the last month or so? Okay. Now put your hand down for a moment. How many of you are willing to share that experience? <laughs> okay. So this is interesting, right? Everybody's felt this feeling before. I certainly, well, you know, one of the reasons why I became a martial artist is because I was tiny and everybody was picking on me. And the, the, my best dream was when I had a karate school 10 years ago, one of those kids came into the karate school, you know, and I was already a black belt. Uh, so it was a very interesting experience. Uh, I felt that way, right? So I could tell you a story, right? When I was young and I was picked on, you know, that was the motivating factor and I began, got a black belt in karate, right? But I'm, this is my field, you know, I feel comfortable doing this, right? But a lot of you here, it really feels weird to talk about a time when you were isolated and lonely. And why do you think that is? Yeah. That's what we shared, we shared with your <coughs> Yeah. Right. Now, just um, stand up for a moment. Do you mind? I'm going to isolate you and alienate you. Okay. <laughs> now, just raise your hand again. How many of you have felt in the last month or two really l had an experience where you just felt like a little uncomfortable, isolated, separate? Raise your hand. Okay, turn around. Just turn around right, and look at everybody, right? A lot of people have felt that way, right? But for some reason, we don't want to share it. And that's the interesting question. What's that? Okay, great. Please do. Do you mind? Your school's basketball team? Uh huh. <laughs> wow. I All right, good. <laughs> So, I mean, I can imagine that how you feel, right? You're on this team, you don't get any points. And you're, you're one of the shortest kids on the team. Okay. Well, now that this, what is your name? What's your name? Oh, and I also don't get invited to some away games. And you don't get invited to away games. All right. We're going to stop you there because. My name is Harrison. Okay. So now, uh, what is your name? Harrison. Um, now that Harrison shared something, can anyone, anyone else do it for us? Any, any other? You want to share one? Yeah, of course. Um, when I was in elementary school, um, I looked, my best friend was sixth grade. He was away to another site. Uh -huh. And he was my only friend in the whole elementary school. So I was really lonely. And I was in sixth grade. I had no friends. Wow. That must have been hard for you. Right? I understand that. Great. So it's, how does it feel to, to tell, talk about that? <laughs> it's a little difficult, right? And I understand that. One of the rules we have in our classroom when we do this is that there's a rule, right? That there's no uh, ridiculing students, right? This is the opportunity for everyone to become comfortable sharing their feelings and that anyone who doesn't do it properly, not who doesn't share properly, but abuses this privilege, gets in a little bit of trouble. Now, what I want to do is introduce you to a new word, right? And some of you in this room um, may know it and some of you don't. But this feeling of being separate or isolated, right, can be, cap can be captured in a, in a fancier word, and that word is alienation, right? And the word alienation means to feel or be isolated from someone or some people. Now, the idea here, right, this is thinking about how our brains work, is the way I introduce this word to you, right? Now, how many of you, be honest, don't worry about if you want to share it or not right now. But when I said, how many of you felt isolated before, really went inside your head and started thinking back, back, back about a time when you felt alienated or separate? Raise your hand. Most of you did, right? It's like, don't think of a white bear. Right? What happens? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not going to say other things. I'm sorry? Sick. 
<laughs> Thank you. So the point is, is that all of you, your brain started getting activated and thinking about a time in your lives when you felt isolated, right? And that's the idea. What we want to do is when we're introducing new language or new words, is we want to get you involved in the process. And by making a personal connection, we're opening up your brain to new information. All right, second part of the program. Let's look at this right now. Now that you know the word alienation, right, what it means. And who can tell me what it means? Somebody new. Raise your hand. No, 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 no. Somebody new. I want somebody. Yes. What does it mean? It means to be isolated from something or somebody. Yeah. Now that we know that the word, al what the word alienation means, how does this design look like the word alienation? Can someone tell me? Yeah, you. They're separated, right. So give me a sentence and that describes that, that design. Right, the circle is lonely from the triangle, right? Or what's the word that we're using right now? Alienated, right? So the circle is alienated from the triangle by the line. Anyone else can tell a different story looking at that design? Yeah. That's interesting. That's a good one. The circle and triangle are separate or alienated from one another because they're different or don't have the same feelings. Great. OK. Now, why do we do this? Well, what we think is it's a very interesting way to get everyone interested in the idea of feelings, right? Firstly, right, designs provide what we call a nonverbal interpretation, right? You've already felt that feeling, right, by me asking you that question. The second thing that we've done here is we've gotten to visualize that feeling of alienation, right? You can see, for example, that alienation is that idea of being separate. And we have many designs. For example, this one on the left. Let me try the word um, commitment. Can anyone tell me how that word, how that design looks like, the word commitment? One mother's thinking, like, my son or daughter, if she goes to this program, <laughs> I'm out of here. All right, how about that? What do you think? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Right? The one line on the right is committed to going in a certain direction where the other ones are not sure what they're doing. I think that's great. Anyone else have a different explanation for that? Yes? To you. Okay, that's great. So how does it look like that? Okay, that could be that way also. Right? There's no... The, the key thing about this is that there's no right or wrong answer, right? As long as you can justify your explanation, and you did a great job. It doesn't look like the word commitment to you because of that, where for that child over there, it did. Now, I can give you some other examples. Um, this one, how about um, greed? How does that look like the word greed? Anyone want to try that? Yes, you over here. OK. So that it looks like the word greed because the circles are keeping all the dots. How about someone else? Another person give me an example for why that looks like greed. In the back? Right, so the, the circle on the right is greedy, right, because it's taking all the dots away. Good. How about this one? Let's use the word elated. Elated is a fancy word for feeling happy. So how does that design look like the word happy? Yeah. They're all joined together. Great. Anyone else? Someone else have a different example? Yeah. Looks like a string of pearls. Expensive one, for that matter. <laughs> right. Now, I'll give you a funny example. When I was teaching this program just a few weeks ago in a class uh, with 10-year-old boys and girls, one young girl said to me, you know, to me, that looks like the word elated because the circles represent areas of Iraq and the lines represent troops going in to freeing all the people who are captured. And that's why it looks happy to me, right? Now, that was very moving for me. It was an amazing experience. Another example, no offense to the parents in this room, was uh, about a month ago, I was in Vancouver giving a talk to parents. And one woman said, it looks like happy because it's getting bigger. And I was like, OK, <laughs> you know, right? And then I made this comment. I said, well, you know, this 11-year-old, 10-year-old girl, you know, gave this example, and everybody in the room was like shocked, 
right? My students here at Yale, I did this example when I was teaching my class on emotional intelligence, and they got insulted that I, I was telling them that 11-year-olds were more creative than they were. Because <laughs> um, they were saying things, well, it looks like elated because, you know, they were giving very simple right reasons. And I said to them, one of the reasons why this is so fun for children is that because it's what we call divergent thinking. It's thinking outside the box, right? What happens a lot of times in school is that we're taught to have one correct answer for our reading, right? We read something, and you get one answer that's correct. Well, with this kind of program and this kind of activity, it's not that way, right? There's many correct answers as long as you can justify them. Now, let's just think about this in the real world, right? We all know, right, that the word alienated now means to feel separate or not part of something. What I would like someone to do for me is someone new, please, is to tell me something that's happening in our society right now and which this experience uh, has been happening. Yeah. Okay. So give me, can you give me like something that happened in the news recently or even something you learned in history or science? How does this, how does this remind you of something in the real world in which that experience happened? Slavery. Slavery? So how, what would the circle represent? So the circle would represent, this. so we're talking about 60 years ago in the South, and the circle represents white people, yes? Right. So he's saying this reminds me of segregation, that the, the, the circle represents one kind of person, white people, the, the triangle represents another type uh, back then for black people, and the line is a separation factor. Great. Anyone else have another idea? Yeah. Religion? So how, would that, how does that look like religion to you? Um, you say the triangle, the one with Jesus and the one with God. Okay. So he, this is a... Right. So now he's relating this to religion. And he's saying that we have different belief systems, right? One religion, another religion, they don't, they're not compatible, right? So they're alienated from one another. That's a great example. How about one more? Yeah. Ah, well that's a very relevant one, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, what we're getting at here is um, this idea of real-world uh, associations for the word alienation. Now, what I'd like to talk about with you, what's your name? Peter? Peter, what do you think we can do? I'm a, I'm a little upset. Right? We have, these, we have one religion, we have another religion, and they seem alienated from one another, right, because of their different beliefs. So, what can we do to reduce this alienation? Okay. So you're saying that these differences are not that important? Not as important as we think they are. Not as important as we think they are. I think that's pretty interesting. I agree with you. Anyone else have another idea on top of uh, Peter's idea of how we can make things, how we can make uh, different religions less alienated from one another? Unitarian. Unitarian? Okay. Well, well can you explain that for me for a moment? Okay. All right. Good. That. Yeah. How about you? Say it again. Protestants. <laughs> All right. Let's take another example. Right. Someone here talked about segregation in the past. Right. That that certain people felt alienated from other people. Right. Let's t as a class. Right. Pretend we're a classroom here. What we can, what can we do to help? Uh, let, let's say we're talking about little children who feel alienated from one another. Right, because they're just different. How do we make them feel less alienated? Yeah. Focus on the things they have in common. Really. Right. So we can focus on what they have in common. That's a great idea. Do you have another idea? Communication. Communication. <coughs> right. So show that maybe like with religion, there's not so many differences. We're, we really have the same. We're the same people. We're just a little different. Yeah. How about you? Right. So sharing more, maybe, right? Sharing more of my life experiences, et cetera, and then we get along a little better. Anyone else have an idea? Yeah. Play a game. OK. How about you? Right. 
Right, very nice. So she's saying by sharing more, right, we realize that there's not, there's not so much differences and one isn't really superior to the other. Now we can go on and on and on. And one of the problems actually with this program is that teachers are complaining that the children in the classes don't want to stop talking, <laughs> which is a great thing for me uh, because I like that idea. They don't like it because they need to actually move on to other subject matters. <laughs> Uh, but the point here, right, that I'm trying to make is that by taking this, uh, we, we're just, remember, we, we, we just started with one word, the word alienation, right? And now we've gotten to a whole broad thing about group differences, right? So what I think is that this word becomes a world, in a sense, that we learn. For example, in the past, I've done this in classes where we've talked about physical disabilities with children who feel alienated, like, because they can't participate in gym. So I brought up questions in the class and said, well, what can we do to make children with disabilities feel more comfortable, right? And then students would say things like, well, we could you know, change an activity in order to make them feel better, right, that they can participate in. And then I'd say, well, that's a great idea. Can someone else tell me something? And then one student would say, well, you know, if we change it in front of that person, that could make them even feel worse, right, because they know we're doing it differently. But because we know in class you know, who's there, right, we should do things in advance. And by preparing in advance, then we could just do the activity without making it so obvious. And what I'm getting at here is that by having these kinds of discussions, right, people build off one another, and uh, people get a much greater understanding of this word and how this concept can help people. And this is just one word. Uh, in our program, they go through a whole bunch of words. All right. Why is this important? Well, I think all of you said this already, a few things, right? We learn how others think and feel and act. We become smarter about the world around us. Right? We become comfortable talking about social interaction. Right? We're using current events like the woman talked about here, the issue that's going on in Florida. We use history. We use religion. We use children with disabilities as different examples. Uh, and we learn what's going on in the real world. One thing that happened to me recently when I was talking to parents is that one parent said that she came home from work and her child was looking through the newspaper you know, crazily trying to find how the word adapt related to the real world. And she was <laughs> you know, like just blown away by that. Right, my child now is looking in the newspaper to try to find real world applications of emotion words. Right, and, the, and that child shared with me her example, which was that, this is back a month, few months ago, which was that Christopher Reeve's wife must, uh, uh, has to learn to adapt to a new life, right, because her husband has gone now and she's going to have to change you know, the way she lives every day. I thought that was pretty great um, to hear from a, a 10 year old student. Now, let's just finish up here by bringing it over to you again. And uh, what Dr. Salive and I are interested in is, so do you think these skills really matter? What do you think? Why, why, why do you think these skills matter? Now don't just, you know, because we're here talking to you about it, you know, agree, right? It's a little bit of a forced, you know, we're forcing you to agree with us. But don't feel that way, honestly. Um, why do you think these skills matter? What do you, how do you think, why do you think the perception of emotion in the face is gonna help you live a better life? Yeah. Yeah, great. Helps you relate to one another, right? If I can feel, like if I'm giving a talk and I say something that makes you uncomfortable, right, and I can perceive that, right, that may, if I have a good skills, I might be able to talk to you about it and say, did I say something that hurt you? Yeah, that might make us have a better friendship. Anybody else? Yeah. Right, yeah, so you can understand people more. That just in and of itself is great. How, yeah, please, go ahead. Yes. Great. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Of course. Of course, yes, you're right. Now, let's just go on to the next few questions here. Um, so we, I already talked about this one. We'll skip this one. We talked about what happens when you can't express yourself and your feelings. But what do you think about teaching these? In, what do you think? Do you think your class would be better if you had this, students? All of our 10 to 12 to 15 to 18-year-olds? What would happen in your classroom if this was going on? 
Yeah. Uh huh. Good. I agree with you. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> yes. You don't. Okay. Let's hear why. Oh, so you're talking about testing now, right? Good. I agree with you. I agree with you about testing, right? But let's not talk about getting a score on a test. Let's say, do you think that, for example, having students in your class get better at reading faces, right? What do you think about that idea? Or getting, maybe having a conversation about at the beginning of the day, right? So how could we get them to be better at it? That's a good idea also, right? And we do do that individually, right? When some children have problems, right, they go see a psychologist and they help them get skills, right? Um, and you have a good point there, and we could talk about that. Um, anybody else have another idea about yes or no? Why should you want Okay, great. So there, well, how, how do they do that? Um, we have a morning meeting where some of the problems we get solved in that meeting. Or, uh, oh, great. We have a group meeting where we go to the morning prayer and everything is easy. Uh huh. That's great. Um, we have them tell us things at the school day, and we can always use the schedule to go to soccer school, or um, you know, first floor strength principal, or the coach of yoga. Wow. Or all three at any time. So it sounds like you have a pretty cool school, or at least progressive. Um, how do you think this is related to academic success? Why do you think that children who are good at these skills actually do better in school? I actually did a study recently in another country, in Spain, and what we found was that um, high school students who had higher emotional intelligence did better at the end of the school year. Right? That was after taking all their general intelligence into consideration. Why do you think these skills matter for getting, getting a good grade on a test? Yeah. OK. Can you explain a little bit more? Okay, so you have more confidence maybe, right, in your ability to perform. Anyone else have an idea of why these skills might matter for your test taking ability? How many of you get nervous when you take a test? <laughs> I get nervous, right, when I had to take standardized tests like those tests in school, right? It made me all nervous that I wasn't going to do well. All right, so maybe if I had skills, right? If I could talk to the teacher and say, I'm really nervous about taking this test, right? She or he would then maybe help calm me down and say, well, let's take deep breaths, right? We develop strategies and skills to help us do better. Good. All right, I want to finish up because I didn't realize how late it is. But um, how, why do you think this would matter for your friendships? Why do you think this would, why do you think people who have high emotional intelligence get along better with other people? Somebody who hasn't, yes. Yeah, right. Maybe they use that blueprint, right? So my friend is annoyed with me, right? If I'm not good at these skills, I don't recognize it, which is a big problem, right? Because now they're irritated with me because I don't recognize that they're irritated, <laughs> right? And I don't have the vocabulary to express myself to them, right? And I don't have the ability to handle it, right? We found people in businesses, for example, that are very good at some of these skills, right? They can read everybody's face, right? which is a great skill, but they're really bad at managing, okay? So what happens, they see everybody hates them or are disgusted, but they don't know how to handle it. <laughs> so they just crumble, right? They're like, they're in a talk right now, and I see everybody's disgusting look, right? But I have no ability to, re to regulate it. All right, so I think we're finished. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, Dr. Salva and I appreciate your uh, attention.